It's Lisa from Been There, Got Out. And today we're welcoming back someone who's been on here before more than once, uh, Stephanie. She's a New York family lawyer and domestic violence expert. And let me see if she's here. Um, I got really lucky um, a couple of months ago. There she is. All right, let me make sure I'm doing this right, Stephanie. It's invited you, I hope. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I was just saying that um, that I got to meet Stephanie in person a couple of months ago. I won't say where, but um, I'll just say it was a conference. But anyway, she looks exactly like she does on camera. I kept thinking there's no one who has the perfect skin, but oh she actually does. <laughs> like She's not using a filter. She's got perfect skin. And um, I think Stephanie was the first person that I had interviewed and then got a chance to meet in real life. So that was so cool. So thank you so much for coming back virtually again, because we always have a lot to talk about. Really cool. You're also the first um, person that I've met that I know from social media. Yeah, it really, it's kind of weird, but it was fine. <laughs> it was like we already knew each other. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so Stephanie, you want to just introduce yourself just in case people haven't seen you before here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Stephanie. I am a domestic violence attorney in New York State. Uh, I focus mostly in family court. I do some other work, some criminal work tangentially, um, but that's my primary focus. And I've been doing domestic violence work for a handful of years now. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you're a unicorn because all of our clients who are dealing with domestic violence, high conflict divorce or separation or post separation abuse are always like, how can I find an attorney? who knows and who understands and realizes what's happening. And um, I'm always thrilled to be one, but you do mostly nonprofit, right? So people can't just, they can't hire, I can't say how can they find you because we won't <laughs> tell. There, I mean, there are nonprofits in every state across the country that have domestic violence focused teams. It's just a matter of finding them, which is not always easy. Right, right. Okay, so one thing that has come up so uh, frequently, and especially at another conference I was with, or I was at uh, a couple of months ago, is the issue of enforcement and the lack of enforcement. And you know, since I've been speaking to you, I've told you about my my own case where it's like, why don't judges enforce their own orders? So, do you see this as an issue? And before you even answer, let me say that. Um, that may, what made me really think about the idea for this topic, besides that it comes up all the time, is that I met a veteran female attorney um, at a conference and she said, this is my last day, I'm retiring. And she said, the reason I, I can't take it anymore is I'm so sick of judges not enforcing their own orders that I don't wanna do this anymore. Yeah, I mean, every single day in every every type of case that we have, you know, I would say the biggest one is, child support, but I'm constantly seeking enforcement on child support, on divorce orders, on custody orders. And it is so rare for any kind of penalty to be imposed by the court, despite there being a court order. And it's like, I remember being fresh out of law school and facing this issue for the first time and thinking, what is the point of a court order? Like this exists, it's signed by a judge, it's issued by a court, they're supposed to be enforceable. And they're so rarely enforced and it's so frustrating. So what can people do about it? I mean, one thing that we talk about is trying to put enforcement language into agreements or into anything so that there's a clear path when the person doesn't follow, doesn't comply with an order that you can go back and get a judge to do something. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? So I certainly think um, enforcement clauses are a good thing. You know, if you can say, if so-and-so doesn't pay by this date, here's the penalty, whether that be interest on the payment or, or some other agreement. The thing is, those clauses usually end up in orders because they're agreed to. Uh, it's rare for judges to order them. And so I very rarely see them in orders. Um, I think paper trails are very, very important. I time and time again have cases where I know I'm going to file this violation, this contempt, and nothing's going to happen with it. But if I have to file six contempts, that's that's really going to, for lack of better words, piss off a judge and make them frustrated that they have to waste their time scolding a grown adult who should know to follow a court order. Um, 
but you know i don't know that there's any like best practice it really comes down to the situation of the parties like in a child support case the best way to get your child support order enforced is having a, a having your opposing party the person who's paying support work a job where their checks can be garnished and that's not something that i or my client are ever going to have control over and so unfortunately the kinds of things that will guarantee you have the ability to enforce down the road are like out of everyone's hands yeah i mean i'm thinking um something something that seemed to work in um one of my cases recently that i was shocked but of course it took a long time was um, there were several counts of contempt. There was a long history to the case. You know, I've been in the system for eight years in my own case, mostly post-judgment. But um, I begged a judge. I said, you know, this person has not complied with court orders. In New York, generally, or sorry, in Connecticut, they generally don't give a deadline and a consequence. So I specifically said, let's assume that this pattern is still going to continue. Can I please have a deadline and a consequence and she actually listened and she gave a deadline and she gave a, a i thought a significant consequence which was an inch an interest percentage that is higher than the state's regular percentage and so i was thrilled because she listened and with that i thought if i do have to move it because i know new york generally does give a deadline at least in my mm -hmm. experience but i could move it to new york to enforce it which i don't have to yeah <laughs> um I'm a but but that that made things a lot easier and i was thrilled but, but i had to ask for that she wouldn't have just given me that and so that's something i learned is to be at least to try to be clear with the judge like this is what i'm asking for but i was going to say too um sometimes people are thinking what's a good what's good enforcement language what's a penalty that seems reasonable for a judge to consider so interest in my experience has been reasonable um i let the judge set the percentage she actually gave more than i would have asked for but are there any other ones that you think might fly versus, let's say, no, don't even bother. That's the, you're going to look bad if you ask for that. I mean, interest is always a good one because the idea of having to pay money is, is enough to deter people from violating court orders. Uh, you know, and we'll include other expenses. Like, I, I rarely get them granted, but I always include attorney's fees in any motion that I file. Um, f filing fees, attorney's fees, incidental fees to having to delay this proceeding or extend this proceeding. What are, what know, are those, Steffi? Can you clarify incidental? I mean, I know court costs, yeah. but just, what are some examples of incidental fees? So, you know, some people will request that they be paid for the day they had to take off of work to go to court to enforce an order that isn't being followed, that they shouldn't have to go to court for because the order already exists. Um, you know, I think especially as someone who works with with low income clients with single parent clients there are so many things that a person has to sacrifice to go to a court date missing work having to pay for child care there's so many extra costs and i it, it's, it absolutely varies person to person but i've found that listing out those costs and telling telling a person an emotion you know i'm going to request that the respondent or the defendant or you know whatever type of party they may be pay for these costs if i have to come back to court to enforce this order yeah i'm so glad you gave some examples because people often don't think can i put a value on my missed time from my job okay i see um there's a question in here which is interesting which i'm thinking i already can guess what you're going to say is can I get costs? Can I get attorney's fees if I prove that the other person lied? I, I, the thing about like most family court situations is it depends on your judge. Um, do judges in family court have the authority to impose that one party pay fees based on some action they took in a case? Yes. Do they actually do that? Rarely. And I, I wish that weren't the answer, but it really does come down to the discretion of the judge. And, you know, what we see as proof of lying is very different than what judges see as proof of lying. Um, and I think they are much quicker to excuse a lie as they forgot or they misspoke or some reason to not truly hold this person accountable for their actions. And so can you make that request? Absolutely. You can make the request. Will that request 
be granted, more likely than not, it's not going to be granted, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, um, I think it was yesterday or a couple of days ago, there's another New York attorney that we talked to named Dennis Petrano, and he did a post on uh, the penalties for lying in court and perjury, mm -hmm. and he said basically nothing. Right. And one of the comments in my um, feed when I reposted his video was, was from a trial attorney who said that he's been working for 30 years and he has never, ever seen perjury mm -hmm. affect anyone. What yeah. have you seen? And it's, and it's up to the court to, to refer the case for perjury. I mean, I don't get to go and file charges for perjury because I saw someone lie on the witness stand. It, it's, it's up to the court to do that. And they don't want to waste their time on it, to be, you know, quite honest. Yeah, I was going to say, but it almost makes me wonder, why does it have that line in there on so many court documents that say, mm -hmm. if you're found committing perjury, you can be in all this trouble, and but it never happens. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't. It's, it's used as a deterrent. Um, you know, it's, it's used as, as a preventative, you know, hope that this will prevent someone from lying. But then when the lying actually occurs, uh, rarely is anything done about it. And it's also incredibly hard to prove that someone is lying. It's, I just feel speechless like some of our people, right? <laughs> because because we, we find we can prove lying, but I guess, like you said, it's the extent of the lying and how does it actually affect things. Right. But still, it's, it's so upsetting. Um, so another thing I'm thinking is, of contempt. Like in my own situation, there were multiple counts of contempt. When I first, when I got the first contempt, I thought, oh, this is so significant. Everything you read says this is the worst thing that someone can, can get in court. A court issues a count of contempt, but nothing happened. Like why, why isn't there punishment for contempt or do you see punishment for contempt? I see it when it has happened repeatedly, which yeah, does not make any sense. You know, what's the point of issuing a, a contempt finding if that finding is meaningless? But really, when I see penalties imposed is when it's been repeated and there are findings that it's happened multiple times. So often, if, if I'm filing violations of an order of protection, I'm not going to strategically, it's often a decision not to file when one or two violations have been made and really wait until multiple will have been made and it's so unfortunate that i have to wait for someone to have their rights violated but yeah i absolutely have had judges say like it only happened one time this is not worth taking up a court time for um or again when it's violation of a final divorce order or a child support order i have child support orders that haven't been paid in 13 months and only now are our motions for contempt in those cases being considered and I wish judges would realize that not being paid for a month, not being paid for two months has an incredible effect on low income families. Yeah. I mean, even though I hate that you're saying that, I mean, I hate that it's true. I'm really glad that you're saying this because I think it helps people to adjust their expectations instead of being, being blown away with like, Oh, something's actually going to happen. And instead realizing that uh, the, the bar is very different. It, you know, we shouldn't go in and I find expecting that, justice, that, right? That go ahead. Being expectations is one of the hardest parts of my job, or maybe just the part that I enjoy the least of, you know, having to tell people up front that there are unlikely to be penalties that for certain actions, that there are, uh, that this case is going to take a lot longer than they think, that the law is not going to automatically, we've talked about this before, automatically be on their side because there's a DV, they are a DV victim. I mean, there's so many expectations to manage and, and that's the worst part is having to tell people not to expect a certain outcome. Do you, do you find, I, I know when I talk to a lawyer, sometimes they say it's hard because, um, because I'm the lawyer, they expect me to save them. Do you find that if you don't get a positive outcome, you get blamed for not being the superhero? No, I mean, I, for the most part, have always worked with clients who are incredibly gracious and recognize that I um, am not the court system. Um, but certainly, regularly, we have clients come in who have an expectation that 
we get to fight outside the bounds of the law. And I was talking about this with one of my paralegals yesterday that, you know, if, if, if I were practicing in the Supreme Court, certainly I could get up there and I could argue that the law is wrong and the law needs to be changed, but I'm in family court. I don't get to do that. I can only argue within the parameters of the laws that exist and I don't get to say those laws are wrong. Um, so at the end of cases, if a case doesn't go someone's way, rarely, rarely do I have clients hold that against me or, or put the fault on me for that. But um, those initial conversations in the beginning of the representation are very difficult because a lot of people do come in expecting that I have a lot more power than I do. Yeah. I saw a question um, or a comment before about swearing in. Like, why do you think that the courts bother swearing people in <laughs> when we start testimony? So it's, it's for us as the lawyers. Um, there is one of the... Th there's a whole bunch of rules of evidence you've seen in my videos on the rules about things you can and can't talk about in a courtroom. And one thing that you always have the right to question someone about is their credibility and their, their honesty. Um, and so I generally can't question something, someone about something they said outside the courtroom. It's hearsay. But if a person takes an oath, whether that be on the witness stand, whether it be when they're making an affidavit, whatever it be, if they swear to telling the truth, I am then allowed to use that in any way that I want to use it. I am allowed to highlight the fact that a person swore they were telling the truth and then didn't. And so does that have a whole lot of weight when it comes to perjury? No, because courts rarely pursue perjury cases, but it's for me. I get to provide proof to the court that this person has taken an oath and made a statement having taken that oath, saying it's the truth, and then I get to use it to argue that they're not a credible witness. Yeah, I, and that's important. I think um, when Dennis did his video, people thought, oh, there's no justice at all. But I think that what he intended to say is what you meant right here, which is, so the court might not punish that person directly for lying, but you as an attorney or, or you as yourself can say, wait a second, but I'm catching this person in a lie. And that affects what the judge will decide to do. Right. And, and so had judges ahead. put that in orders. I've had judges issue orders where they state in the final order, this person was caught changing their testimony or saying conflicting statements. And I find them a non-credible witness. And so that goes into their decision. And it also goes into future decisions because we know people end up back in family court constantly. And I now have a record that they've previously been deemed an uncredible witness by a family court judge. And I can use that in the future. Right. And that's what I've done myself in my own cases. That's why I love transcripts. Yes. And then when, when, sometimes orders contain very strong language from a judge. And because we know that when cases go on for years, judges change. And so the next judge, you have to catch them up all over again. And in my experience, it's a really good way to do it is to cite transcripts and orders using the actual language of the court and the language that other judges have used to, to sort of tip off the new judge. This is, this, uh, this is my opponent's history in court. And so I've benefited from a lot of wonderfully strong language to build the case. But again, it, it takes a long time, but you, yeah. you can get somewhere and credibility does matter a lot, even if the court's not directly choosing to punish that person. Um, justice can be served in other ways. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not always the justice that people are looking for, but it, it is something we can use down the line. Um, it's just a different type of justice. Yeah. So, but I was going to go back to um, the effect on your clients and, and people here. What do you think happens when courts don't enforce their own orders? Like what, I mean, I know in my own life how it's affected us and how it affects our clients. But what do you, what do you see when people are just like, what's, nothing's happening to that person? Somebody who takes advantage, what do you think happens? I mean, it, it, people lose all of their faith in the justice system and I don't blame them for it. I have so many people who are disheartened and who really want to just give up and dismiss their cases because they've had four or five appearances where a person has not been held responsible for their actions. Um, and, and unfortunately that, that sentiment spreads and then you have people not only losing their faith in their judges, losing their faith in the entire court system, losing their faith in the attorneys that practice in that court system. And I think for some people it has an effect on my relationship with, with current clients or future clients who have been so disheartened by 
their experiences that they've totally given up on on the legal system as a whole. And I, again, I don't blame them for it. Yeah, it's really tricky. I'm thinking um, that in my experience, and I'll share a little story of something that happened recently, that when, when somebody doesn't obey the law and gets away with it, it just makes them get worse in their behavior because it teaches them that they can get away with it. And so um, recently in one of my court appearances, I was asking for sanctions, which we know is really hard to get. And the judge was like, yeah, we're not going to do that. You're just going to take what's owed and we're not doing that. And I said, um, Your Honor, not to be disrespectful, but I just want to say that this court's failure to enforce its own orders has penalized my family and I, but it's emboldened the defendant to weaponize the court system to his advantage. And the judge actually sat up and said, oh, I need to take note of what she's saying. What, do you, I don't know what I said, but what, what made him pause? And then I got a, a good yeah. thing happen after that. But what did I, what did I say? <laughs> that, I, mean, that I woke think, him up. and it really depends on, on the judge too, but I think for a lot of judges, having them face the fact that they could be accountable for something in the future that happens as a result of their failure to act really makes them listen. I mean, judges do not want to get appealed. They try very, very hard not to get appealed. Um, you know, someone commented on one of my videos the other day, and I meant to, I meant to make a video about this, something about how she was denied a protection order and said to the judge, okay, who should my family sue when I end up dead? And I had a DV advocate once in court. Um, we had a client with an order of protection that was being violated and the judge did not want to extend the order uh, which was expiring soon and one of he initially denied the extension one of my advocates went up to the judge and said your name will be what's on the front of the paper when she gets killed uh and i've been talking about this a lot at work lately with the mass shootings that continue to happen in the United States. 80% of mass shooters have a history of domestic violence, largely a history of domestic violence that was not um, prosecuted in any way, uh, or charges were dropped or jail time was not issued or whatever it may be. It, it was, this person was not held accountable. And when domestic violence goes held unaccountable, mass tragedies happen, deaths happen. Um, and it's so unfortunate that we have to make such blunt, you know, almost scary comments to judges, but it's like, you have to make them realize that their individual decision is going to lead to an outcome that's going to make them look bad. And it's so bad that I have to say, you're going to look bad if you make the decision. And yet, in some cases, it's the only way that's led us to get the outcome we're trying to get. Yeah. I don't know if you can see the comments saying, what can we do? <laughs> If I, I had to, that all the time, I know. Yeah, I mean, advocacy. I think I think this information needs to be shared. Um, I think there's not a a lot of judges are elected. I don't know that people know that family court judges uh, are largely elected in a lot of states, uh, and they're the kind of politicians that rarely have information out there about them. And you can go and Google whoever's running for mayor in your town and, and learn about their, their past and their history. But people rarely research judges, and I think that's so important. But the other important thing is putting forth candidates for judges that are understanding of these issues. And most judges that do get elected are unopposed. So what you can do is educate yourself and your communities on the people who are going to be holding the positions that are making these decisions and also put forth candidates that are going to fit that position better, that are going to be educated, that are going to be understanding of the issues. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to meet somebody who's in New Jersey. She's a family lawyer and she has a background with domestic violence. And she said her big dream is to become a family court judge. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, yeah, you don't usually meet that many people that say that that's what they want to do, or at least I don't. Yeah. But um, I thought she'd be phenomenal. Yeah, it's I, you, you're, you're right. You rarely meet people that want to run, that want to be a family court judge. And it's interesting because parts of New York State do it differently. So um, in parts of New York, 
you run for family court. You run to be a family court judge, and that's the position you're elected for. But in other in other parts of New York State, you run for a tier of judgeship, and that could be a number of courts that are on that first tier. And family court is just one of them, and so you don't know which court you're going to get placed with. So, it's a uh, I'm not a big fan of that because I want people who know family court issues and know DV being appointed to family court. Yeah. So um, back to the, I, I was going to, someone asked this question and it might be a long one, but maybe you can just touch on a couple of things. Um, you talked about managing client expectations. Say someone's going in to file a restraining order. What are some ways that you might prepare them for what's going to happen in that courtroom? Absolutely. Um, I always explain the differences between the types of orders. So I've talked about stayaways versus refrain from, um, you know, a no contact order versus just a no harassment, no stalking, no assaulting order. Uh, and I, I tell people the kind of incidents that qualify them for those different orders. It, it's really one of the hardest things is I have so many people who have been threatened with harm, but have never experienced physical harm. And again, depends on the judge you end up in front of, but there are so many judges who are not going to issue a full no contact order if there's been no physical abuse. Um, another one I have to have a discussion about a lot is children. People often want to include their children in their orders. And if the children were not victims of abuse or were not present for the abuse, didn't witness it, again, judges are hesitant to, to include them in the orders. And the way I try to explain it is in the same sense that you cannot convict someone for a crime they haven't committed. You can't issue an order of protection against someone for an action they haven't taken. And mm. I, they're frustrated and they should be. I mean, if, if your partner has been a danger to you, you absolutely have reason to believe they will be a danger to your children. But if an incident has not happened, you don't legally have grounds to get them included in your order of protection. And that is, that's one of the hardest expectations to manage because people come in here assuming that that's a no brainer. Uh, and unfortunately it's not. Yeah. I was going to say, do you, a lot of our clients have dealt with opposing counsel, really bullying them, especially when they get, they go for restraining orders. Do you find that that happens frequently as well? A lot of bullying, a lot of really downplaying the abuse. I, I, I hear a lot of judges and attorneys say, oh, you know, this is just a couple fighting. Like you're both being petty. You're just arguing over stupid things. You need to grow up and be adults. And it's so much more complex than just growing up and behaving like an adult. Uh, and yes, I hear that constantly. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating to say it's, it's not actually frustrating. It's not the word. I think it's re-traumatizing because yeah. um, you're already not believed and then to have an authority pick at you, it just makes it worse. It just yeah. makes it like the whole experience is another trauma. We talk about court, court induced trauma. Court is a trauma. I mean, it, the entire court procedure is a traumatizing process and that's why so few people decide to go through it. Yeah. 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 So speaking of that, um, I saw that you had done, I think, a post recently about this, and I attended this litigation abuse workshop where they commented on it. What do you think of having, um, some people believe it's best to have the same judge stay in a case. Others say, I want to get rid of this judge. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think um, of the benefit, the pros and cons of having the same judge stay in a case? Um, I've had a lot of cases and a lot of my colleagues have had this situation recently where with how delayed cases were throughout the pandemic and just in the area where I am right now, we're constantly having judges moved around from court to court where we're, we're in cases now that are on their third or fourth judge. Um, and that to me is a huge disservice to my client because I've spent the last two years making this judge understand the history of abuse and now I have a whole brand new person who may or may not read the file or who may just have their clerk read the file and then summarize it for them. Um, I am not a fan of switching judges because I want someone who knows the history of my case. Of course, there are exceptions to that because there are judges who are going to deny abuse anytime it's in front of them. And certainly I don't want to be in front of that person. And certainly if I have the opportunity to not be in front of that person, I'm going to take it. So I, on top of that, I do think it, it varies from judge to judge. 
generally though, like you don't always have a choice. Most, most court systems prioritize keeping a family in front of one judge. So if your case closes, you get a final order and a year later, there's a modification. They're going to try and stick it back in front of the same judge who knows their history and knows their case. And again, if I spent years making sure this judge understood the nuances of what was happening to my client, I don't want to have to do that all again. I don't want my client to have to go through that all again when I can end up in front of someone who already heard all of that testimony. Yeah, I know from that workshop, they said that uh, the one of the judges who was speaking, who also um, was skilled, schooled in domestic violence, said um, that she prefers, and this was in Canada, she said it's better to have one judge stay on the case because that way they know all the details and they really can go deep into it. And when the per you know, they can watch the patterns of behaviors happen over time. And I know um, in my case, uh, part of it, we had the same judge for a long time, but then she was transferred to civil court. And of course, we stayed in court, but she came back to still do our case. And I kind of like, mm -hmm. at first I was like, Ugh, I, I don't, I mean, she'd make very slow decisions. So I was frustrated with her, but I talked to an attorney who knew her and he said, you know, that's actually a really good thing that she came back because it means that on some level she cared. Like she was taking her time out of her civil cases to still stay on your case. I what do you that, think? And with a few cases recently and it's, it's, judges are very transparent about the cases they like and the cases they don't. And I've had, a number of judges be transferred on cases and some have kept the case and some have said, I'm not taking this case with me. I don't want this case. It's going to go to someone else. Um, and yeah, they, to a point, have the discretion to do that. It's interesting because you say when a judge says, I like the case, I'm thinking, who would like <laughs> like a crazy, long, drawn out, high conflict case, but for whatever a lot reason, she's of time she doesn't keep it if they don't think it's going to go on much longer. Um, oh because they don't want the hassle of a case that's going to take another two years. Oh, well, she was wrong about that. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's OK. All right. Um, another thing I was going to say, and now I'm going to ask like a little bit of stuff that I've gotten from our clients are like, make sure you ask for this. Mm -hmm. So what about somebody who is up against uh, an ex in court who has tremendous financial resources and they feel like if we go back to court, it's just going to become, you know, the typical financial lose. I'm going to lose because I don't have any money or I don't have that much money and I don't have that much time. And it's just so unbalanced. I know you see this all the time. Um, are there ways to, to circumvent going back to court to make somebody comply with orders? Honestly, no. I mean, if, if an order is not being followed, it, I wish, I wish I had a better answer, but the answer is you have to get the court involved to enforce it. The only exception really is with um, child support not being paid, the support collection unit in New York, I don't know if this applies to other states, has the authority to suspend a person's driver's license if they are not paying their support. That is usually a, a pretty, usually does the job and gets people to start paying again because they need to be able to drive their car to go to work and do the other things they need to do. Although if you live in a very urban area with public transit, not so much if they don't need a car to get where they're going. Aside from that, again, wish I had a better answer, but it, it, orders that are not being followed, unfortunately, almost always require court intervention if you want something done about that. Aside from orders of protection with very clear obvious violations where the police will arrest but it, we all know there are so many violations that are made on orders of protection that the police don't feel is within their ter territory and will tell you to go back to court anyway so even that is limited again i appreciate the harsh new york reality check but we need we need to hear it because we need to manage our expectations and accept that reality okay so i just saw a quick question how do you get divorced in this country if you're broke well, most, uh, first and foremost, most states uh, will do fee waivers for filing a divorce. Um, in New York State, it costs around $200. But if you submit a fee waiver stating your economic situation, if you're unemployed, if you're a full-time student, uh, you are eligible to get that fee waived. Um, and like I've said before, there are nonprofits all over the country. The, the reality is most people just don't know about them, but I know many throughout New York State. I've worked at many throughout New York State. I know part, our partner agencies in our neighboring states. Um, I always say go to womenslaw.org and search by your state for a non a nonprofit that does this work. But there are so many nonprofits across the country that do 
family law that do specifically domestic violence based family law. It's just a matter of putting in the work to find them, which is not always easy, especially if you're low income and you don't have a computer, you don't have internet, you don't have a smartphone, or you're at a, you're living in a domestic violence shelter where you don't have access to a computer. So it's one, knowing these places exist and two, knowing how to find them. But you can file for a divorce even if you are low income, you have the legal right to do that. You have the legal right to a fee waiver. Um, and, and you don't need a lawyer. I mean, certainly it is better to have a lawyer, but I mean, thousands of people file for divorce and go through the process without an attorney. Yeah. I was going to I know that the next question that's going to come is a quick one. Women's law.org. Do they do men and women or just women? It, it is for anyone who wants to use it. Um, they, to my knowledge, I don't I don't know any organizations that are on there that only serve women. I'm sure they exist, but um, I can tell you agencies I've worked there are on there and I've never worked at an agency that only serves female clients. Okay. All right. So note that men here right now. Okay. Um, here's another one. It's the holidays and people are trying to travel and uh, several of our clients are having getting a travel letter weaponized against them where their family lives in another country or across the country and um, they're just not able to do it. So, you know, or every time they want it, it's this big battle. Is there anything um, that you can think of like a permanent travel letter where somebody goes on a regular business, a uh, regular um, schedule to keep visiting their family that they, they don't have to like beg for it all the time? Have you heard of something like that? I regularly include that in custody orders if I know that it's been an issue in the past, um, especially for the holidays. I always include a holiday order because without fail, you get to the holidays and, and an argument starts about who's going to get the kids when and who gets to do what with the kids. Um, I always put holidays in the custody order. I always put travel guidelines in custody orders. Can this person travel out of state? Can they travel out of the country? Um, sometimes we'll say they need the other person's permission to travel out of the country or they need to show proof of a return ticket um, for cases where someone is threatening to take the child out of the country and not return. I've had orders say that they have to show proof that they intend to return. Um, whatever the situation may be, I think it's incredibly important to have that put in a court order before it happens. And I've never had a judge push back on that. Judges tend to appreciate it when you say, hey, I know it's June, but we may not end up back here before Thanksgiving, so can we get a holiday order uh, now? If you don't have a custody order legally, either party can travel with the child wherever they want. Um, yeah, and, and that's a lot of the cases I take are cases where that happened and the child was not brought back. And you call the police and nothing can be done because you don't have a custody order, so they're not doing anything wrong. Um, so. Oh, custody orders are important. I always advise people, if you fear that that's going to happen, get a court order. Um, you know, let the court know that you fear your child is going to be taken out of state or out of the country because judges absolutely will issues that issue orders that state cannot leave the state with the child, cannot leave the country with the child. But if it's a regular travel, I just address it ahead of time. I always go to Florida for the week of Christmas. We're Respondent will not create any barriers to my ability to do that. In return, I will allow respondent to travel with the children the week of New Year's or whatever it is. Um, just getting ahead of it, I think, is the, is the best solution. Yeah, uh, that's. I mean, that's really good to know. Okay, um, I see a couple other questions, but there's a couple I want to get to first, and I'm, I just want to check the time. Okay, uh, it's like it just flies. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so I know um, we've talked about this, and I wanted you to reiterate legal decisions versus parenting decisions. What are some things that the court stays out of deciding and including details of actual parenting schedules? Judges do not want to make decisions that are more subjective to people. Uh, so judges are going to decide who gets, who has the right to make legal decisions for the child. If they find there's a history of one parent making unsafe choices, they're gonna rule that parent doesn't get to make choices at all. But judges, generally, they're going to order visitation schedules. Um, they're not going to order, and, and I regularly have people say, I want this in a custody order. They're not gonna order 
when your kid is old enough to have a cell phone. They're not going to order when your kid is old enough to have sleepovers. Um, you know, they're not going to- about what they eat? Yes, what they eat, what extracurriculars they do. It, it, they don't want to deal with that. Like most of them have their own children to parent. They don't want to be deciding how other people's children are parented too. And yeah, regularly I have people coming to me saying, well, I want to order that their kid, the kid is going to go to bed at this time at the other parent's house. The judge is not getting into that. It's not their job to, to parent your children. That is a parenting decision. They're ordering um, who gets to make decisions, who gets to decide where the kid is enrolled in in school, uh, what kind of doctor the child is seeing, medical treatments they're getting. Um, they are very hesitant to order vaccine-related orders, um, which was a big thing at the very beginning. Oh, no, still, a lot of people still, in yeah. Those cases, and judges do not like. They will decide who gets to make the medical decisions. They will not decide what those medical decisions are. Yeah, yeah, very good to know. Okay, here's an, a quick one. How do you handle when the other attorney is trying to burn up all the time? when you have a hearing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I regularly experience that. You know, it's frustrating because judges will give them a lot of leeway, so much leeway. I mean, I had a trial last week where we spent like a good 35, 45 minutes because someone couldn't figure out how to share their screen. And we had only put an hour and a half aside for the trial that day. And at a certain point, like you have to be the bad guy. Um, and I have, if I'm on a team with multiple attorneys, have offered to be the bad guy many times, but at a certain point, you have to be a bad guy, and you have to say, like, we've had this many delays, and it's inappropriate. I, I mean, you have a constitutional right for your case to be heard in a timely manner. Everyone has that constitutional right, uh, and there was some leeway with that with COVID, and even though we're two years later, going on three years later, that leeway is still being given, so... I always say speak up for yourself. You have constitutional rights. You have a right to be heard. You have a right to be heard in a timely manner. You have a right to no unfair delays. But in terms of managing expectations, judges give a lot of leeway to attorneys, um, especially if you have virtual court. They give a lot of leeway to attorneys with tech issues, which I don't find acceptable. Um, but I'm also much younger than a lot of my opposing attorneys and grew up with technology that they did not have. I'm thinking um, <laughs> in person when that person, the other counsel is monopolizing the time. How can you politely say, uh, what about, <laughs> how can I have a chance to be heard? Is there, is there some court etiquette of how you can in politely or have your attorney politely interrupt when it's gone? It's so unbalanced. Mm -hmm. I, I will interrupt and I will say respectfully, Your Honor so-and-so has been heard for the last 15 minutes. I am entitled the same right to be heard just as they are. And we've got 15 minutes left. So I'm asking that the court give that time to me. Um, Love it. It's going to piss people off. I mean, the, that's advocacy. Like you, you have to interrupt at some point. You have to say I'm entitled to the same things that they are. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to raise that entitlement and take my opportunity now. It, yeah. It's that's great. You got to interrupt at some point. <laughs> good, very good to know. Okay, um, and then like last kind of biggish question is how have you seen CPS or uh, Child Protective Services help or harm a case? And I'm thinking also managing expectations too. Um, I've seen them do both. You know, it's uh, a again as someone who represents low income parties. Uh, I see a lot of cases where people are having um, CPS cases opened against them for issues stemming from poverty. And I don't think that uh, CPS and similar government institutions have the requisite understanding that it's, it's not poor parenting that leads to certain outcomes. It's a lack of access to resources. But I will say over time, I have seen a trend towards trying to help impoverished families so that they're not having these cases filed against them. I know most counties in New York State have DSS programs that are now dedicated to recognizing when an issue is stemmed from a lack of a resource and, and they look into how we can get that family that resource. Um, so I see both. You know, I, I see people having cases open against them for problems that they did not 
not caused for issues that are not their fault. And I, and I see the opposite. I, I certainly have my cases where neglect cases were opened against the abusive parent or abuse cases were opened against the abusive parent as they should be because that person um, is taking actions that are putting the children in harm's way. So it's both. And, you know, just like I say for judges, it's hit or miss. It depends on who the agent is. It depends on who the caseworker is. Um, what sucks in my position is they are not required to speak to me and oftentimes will not speak to me. So I try very hard, and I've said this in videos, to have um, attorneys for the child on the case, even if there's also a CPS attorney, because that person can speak to me and often will speak can to me. You, can you just say, I know what an attorney or an AFC mm -hmm. attorney for the child is. Can you just explain what that is and what the difference between that and a guardian ad litem is? Right. So it varies state by state. In a lot of states, a guardian ad litem is the same thing as an attorney for the child. Um, in other states, they're not an attorney at all. It's just someone who advocates for the child. I, but I prioritize in cases where CPS is involved, having an, an AFC because CPS doesn't represent the child. They represent the state. They represent the county usually. Um, so their job is, is to pursue the county's interests, not the interests of the child. An attorney for the child is an attorney appointed to represent their child. It used to be in New York State that the law said that their job was to determine what they think is best for the child and report that to the court. That law changed. That law now says that their job is to inquire what the child wants and report that back to the court. So even if they disagree, it is still their job to say this is what the child wants. If the child is, is young, you know, if it's a baby, they can substitute judgment and say, this is what I think is best for the child. But that person is allowed to speak to me where a CPS attorney is not. Uh, and I oftentimes will, will speak to them and work with them and make sure they have access to the child if my client is the custodial parent. Um, and sometimes I will harp on them and push them to make sure they're meeting with the child because lots of them don't. But it's an attorney who represents the child in a court case and whose job it is to advocate for their interests, not the state's interests. All right. Excellent. All right. So I know we're low on time, but I just want to say, Stephanie, how can people see more of your content? So they can't directly hire you, but you have loads of stuff and super educational information, a lot of um, information on different cases that are going on as well and rules of evidence. And so, I mean, everybody learns so much from seeing your content, but where can they find your content Thank best? You. I only very recently started sharing um, some of my videos on Instagram. I try to keep it to the family court DV context on here, where, as you've said, I talk about other legal areas on my TikTok yeah. page, but I'm here on Instagram. It's Steph underscore NY underscore law, and it's the same on TikTok. And I post a lot more on there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm sure this is not the last time we're going to be talking here. I hope not. <laughs> All right. All right. So happy holidays and I'll catch up with you soon. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye. bye.